the abscondo podcast welcome to the abscondo podcast i'm here today uh with prasad paul duffy who's recently recently written a book called you are love hi, hi paul or prasad what should i call you prasad okay tell us about your book a little bit well, I um, channeled it in the jungles of um, Thailand last year uh, in two and a half weeks. And then it, I edited it when I moved to Costa Rica last spring. And then I traveled and then I came back. And during COVID, I edited it a few more times. And then I waited to the right time to publish it. And I feel now is that the, uh, the initial wave of fear and uh, lockdown has passed and now People are beginning to question their reality. So I, I want to uh, give a book that allows them to get in touch with true reality, their true self, and the true solution to the challenges that they're going through right now. We're going to dig into that. I, I find it fascinating that you said you channeled the book in two and a half weeks. I've recently written two books as well and similar topics. In fact, I wrote a book about love also a couple of years ago called Be Love. So we can talk yeah, about this from different perspectives. Be love. And, and my books, I also write in about two and a half weeks, the same way you just said it. It just, it just comes to you. You, you. you let it flow. It's not that difficult to do. And, and um, it's just the, the type of spiritual, I think when you're, when you're truly channeling something spiritual, whether you're talking like we are today or whether you're writing, I think it comes so easily and, and just flows nicely in a short amount of time. Would, would you agree? Is that how you always write or, or, or speak? No, I also write screenplays and plays. Uh, my play Revolutionary that you might have seen on my website. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you notice that? I did. I didn't get too far into it, though. Yeah. I apologize. That <laughs> musical, the script for it, the play itself that I wrote, has been in process for 10 years. And wow. the next production I do, I will continue to rewrite it. It, isn't, it, it hasn't landed fully, but it turns out it was super prophetic about what's going on in the streets. Uh, today. So, uh, fortunately, the finale, the final act, is about uh, these people who are, you know, the, the play is about homeless people dealing with uh, being chipped in the future, being dragged off to FEMA camps, the kind of doom and gloom scenario of conspiracy theorists. But in the end, through meditation, ayahuasca th ceremony, and uh, therapy, these young people become enlightened to fifth dimensional consciousness interesting well let's go back to your book um you know i, I know you've been you said to me i think for 35 years you've been a, you started off with course with a course in miracles which is of course all about love versus fear you know transcending ego and um so I, this is not a new topic for you what what inspired you to write a topic called you are you know a book called you are love specifically th you know this year or i guess it was last year going into this year what was it about the, the current yeah, time? I was guided to, I was guided to write it uh, for those people who are still identified with their body and with their personalities, with their lives, and are suffering because it hasn't reached the expectation that they wanted, that they were programmed to believe they wanted, which is to find that perfect lover and fall in love and, uh, you know, uh, be loved not be loved, be loved, right. and have a family, etc. And a lot of people have not succeeded at that, or their true self doesn't want that. So my book gives people who are single, uh, not in a relationship, permission to celebrate their life as it is. And it also invites everyone, whether they're in a relationship or not, to embrace their solitude, mm -hmm. to learn how to love themselves in their own energy field so that they're not constantly seeking approval from their lovers and their loved ones and feeling suffering when they're not getting what they believe they need. Right. So it's getting. really for, and it's also for new people who I've never worked with before. I feel like that title might attract people who don't even know they're on a spiritual path. Yeah. I've, I've counseled uh, hundreds of couples over the years so I know that issue, and so I, I, I was guided to bring the non-dual teachings that you and I vibrate at to people who are having relationship issues. Yeah, interesting. And the word love is something that everyone thinks they understand, 
and you t- you're trying to tell someone to read about love and, and learn about it, and and your first reaction is typically maybe I'm, from my experience with people that are not have not read the things we have, gone through the journeys we have, they you know they well everyone knows what love is. I don't need to read about it, right? So how yeah. do you convince? I mean, how do you convince someone that they don't well, know the what love chapter. is? Yeah. Yeah. The first chapter, which I moved from a later chapter because the second through fourth chapters are really deconstructing your mind, looking at the ego's need for survival, wearing survival masks, because the journey of the book is helping people realize who they're not first in order to realize who you are. Right. So love is a word that people are comfortable with, we're very familiar with, but I moved the chapter, The Mystery of Love, to the beginning of the book so mm-hmm. that I'm really exploring the concept of love from a fresh place for people. I mm-hmm. question their ideas about love, and then I help them see that love is actually not a verb. Love is not something we do, give or receive. Mm-hmm. Love is who we are. So I say it right off the bat, but then I take people on the journey of how to realize that in a true and authentic way. Interesting. And where do you go from here? So yeah, love being what we are, that's, that's, I, I fully agree, of course. And it's, it's also an energy. It's also, is it not life, life itself, the life force itself. It's also once you, once you come to embrace this, it's the, the only, it's the true thought, it's the thought system. It's the true thought system versus ego. So being what we are, it's kind of everything that we are meant to do and, and be and feel. And, and, and it's, it sounds very, this sounds just so esoteric to people, I think, because, because it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to resonate in terms of, you know, I think a lot of it is, let's go back to your relationship discussion. I mean, are you, have you been single for most of your life or are you in a relationship right yeah. now? Okay. I've been single for most of my life and, but I've dated many people. I was a very attractive young man. <laughs> <laughs> they still are very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but the last uh, three years ago, I was swimming in my pool, and this angel statue um, that my friend has in her garden um, spoke to me, but it was really my own inner voice, yeah. and challenged me to uh, be celibate. And uh, I accepted that challenge, and it has freed me up. Uh, on so many levels. The mind is not chasing that anymore. And more importantly for me is it makes me a safe um, spiritual teacher Mm -hmm. for people to come and be with, like Amici. (laughs) I just compared myself to Amici. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Uh, Whereas there's a lot of Indian gurus and a lot of other uh, new age teachers they're, some of them are as bad as the Me Too Hollywood movement, right. which I spent the last decade in Hollywood developing conscious media, conscious films, conscious music. And uh, so I came out of that. And I've always felt it's super important that uh, someone who holds himself in some authority figure or their student does never crosses the line, ever. Mm-hmm. So that's been my path all these years. So it's just easier at this point at my age to just, and of course, if I fall in love again with a partner, of course I would um, no no longer be celibate. But as a single person, and that's, you know, I don't really say that in the book. I don't want to give advice to people. I appreciate your openness. Yeah, and I appreciate you being open. When you're single, it's better to be celibate until you find a partner who you dig, who you really feel this could go somewhere and then right. explore something. Because you're pulled into the relationship. They want, they, it leads to expectations of, of being pulled into a monogamous relationship and, and things like this happening, of course. And, and by the way, you know, I think part, I think a very big part of love, the thought system of love, the, you know, to be love is to be completely honest. I don't think that it's possible to, to withhold honesty and, and reflect love, the truth thought system of love. I think it's perfectly open and honest. And I think part of the, one of the things that people struggle with is to be in traditional monogamous relationships where there's so many expectations about how you're not free or you're not allowed to, you know, where were you last night and who were you talking to, who are you chatting with, who are you writing to? And, I, and when I was in a marriage for 22 years, and I'm, I, I, spoke, I spoke just now about being honest. I'm honest with you. I'm honest with my audience, uh, which sometimes is hard for people to, to hear, but I, I answer everything and share my, my life journey openly and honestly, whether or not it's difficult to hear. 
But when I was in a relationship, a 22-year marriage, you know, good good relationship, I thought at the time, and um, it just caused so much pain and suffering for me. And I could never have gone down this path within that relationship because because you have different concerns. You just you you feel that lack of freedom, and you and you don't really feel that the ability to go to that self-love it's covered up with shame it's covered up with someone trying to guilt you that you're not right that you should be different from how you are and you believe it after a certain amount of time you're conditioned to believe it so i when i talk to people and write to people i think one of the biggest obstacles that they're facing in terms of their spiritual awakening if you want to call it that or just uh you know escape from ego or, or shattering of the ego disidentification but there's of course thousands of words for all these concepts but the biggest issues they, I think people are facing if they're in a marriage, traditional marriage, is th that's probably the biggest issue, the biggest roadblock. Well, you know, especially through the 70s, the idea of polyamory and uh, promiscuity, you know, was explored. Um, then, of course, AIDS came. I was part of the whole AIDS uh, um, epidemic in uh, New York City in the 80s. And it was actually my first awakening. I uh, worked with a woman who had healed from AIDS and she was a disciple of Osho and she gave me mm -hmm. my first Papaji book, which was who became my guru, Papaji. Um, so I think the AIDS changed and brought awareness to that sexual freedom and shut people down. And I think the millennials and Generation Z have a different relationship to sex than people of our generation did. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I mentioned the whole idea of celibacy before before you get serious, until you get serious, until you get serious, and not just to deplete your sexual energy chasing approval. And I think in your relationship, your first marriage, you were coming from your ego. You hadn't awakened yet, so your ego yeah. was suffering and looking for love outside of yourself. In my book, I call it looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. And then I, uh, those first few chapters are helping to heal the shame that we feel is until we heal the shame, we, our ego is going to be active. But exactly. When you heal the shame, you can be humble. The ego can then be in its place, a humble servant. But right. when it's shame-based, the way so many of us have been programmed, it's constantly looking for approval, constantly looking outside of itself. So the book helps people realize who we're not and then direct the attention inward. And the love, as you know, we feel it. When you're not in your mind, right. you're in love. That's true. When you're in the present moment, when you're, when you're still, when you're laying in your bed looking at the ceiling for a while, and you, and you try to think about, you know, is that, is that in there? Is that within me somewhere? Can I, can I feel it? Can I experience it? And I think, I think the first time I was aware of it, it was after the marriage was over, or not the first time, but when it was clear to me, it was, it was a moment when I just realized that I'm not guilty. You know, I'm not guilty of all those things. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm a good person. I didn't mean to hurt anybody, whatever I did. Say to your uh, listeners is to address the guilt you said when a relationship ends and um, that the person in the relationship is in it to grow. So if somebody triggers you, then you are responsible for your reaction. If your partner's intentions are good and coming for lo from love, like you were in your marriage, then the other person needs to work on themselves to receive how you, they're being triggered. That's right. But ultimately, ultimately, the realization of who we are as one love, when you wake up in non-duality, you wake up to the oneness that we are. And everyone you perceive is a reflection of your consciousness. I call it the mirror of relationships in my book. Mm -hmm. So I perceive people as my own self. There is no separation. And so certain people mirror me in ways that are unifying, like you. We are so much the same self in two bodies. Right. All of our interests from awakening, writing, music, filmmaking. Not, not, not the celibacy part, but everything else probably. <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, of course. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting on that note, uh, Drew Chadwick, who is a uh, pop singer that I work with, he's one of my number one students, friends. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he was my X Factor with a band called Emblem 3. They got mm -hmm. very popular. He woke up and I guide him on his journey. And today he called me from the States and said, I want to do a podcast with you. We have to do a podcast. And he appreciates 
all of the counseling I do for him on his relationships, he's only 27, mm -hmm. but he also today acknowledged the fact that I'm celibate and that I've kind of transcended without repression one of the basic lower drives that, that is, you know, screwing with so many people. And all the monks in India where I've lived and all of the spiritual texts from there, they suggest it at some point. At some life. point. And Osho, um, Osho talks about that too, where he's, Osho's philosophy was basically to go through what you have to go through, experience it, accept it. And at some point, hopefully you've, you've had enough and you know what that is and he stopped chasing it. And that's kind of where I've gone. I haven't made a decision. Obviously, I'm in a relationship now. I wouldn't be celibate. But in terms of chasing it, that was a very destructive thing for me. And I think it is for everyone, especially men probably, um, for some part of your life. But I think repressing it, you know, I I have some some friends that are, that are um, LDS missionaries that are repressing it. And I, I wonder how that turns out. I, it must be a very difficult path. Um, but I think it, the, well, the, the point being, just to finish the point, is that we do have to get to a point where that doesn't drive our thinking and our behavior. We should be able to treat women or treat the op whoever we're attracted to, we should treat as human beings lovingly, accepting, without some agenda to get something that you want to conquer for yourself and, and to not even have to think about that and go there. So it can't be, it can't be a very significant part of your life um, if you're going to be centered and in and, and, and a good place and, and living in joy and in love. Well, Osho used to say, give up the ship and relationship and just relate. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. And what I'm, what I'm saying is what you're saying, next level. Right. They're not just a human being. I don't even believe we're human beings. That's part of this dream of life that we're in. We perceive ourselves as these separate humans but actually, we are one God consciousness, one love. And like I said, we're all mirrors for each other. So when I love myself, I love you. If I don't love myself, I can't love you. And I can't even let the love you have for me in. So, you know, the first half of the book deals with the work that you've been doing, I've been doing to help clear the space of the ego identification so that we can simply be quiet and as Jesus said, be still and know that I am God. And so of course, love, God is love, right? Love is God. God is love. It's the same thing. Love. And, both words the are, and both words are totally misunderstood. <laughs> totally. So whenever you are with your partner, you're with your own self. Of course, or with anyone else. And you can't let someone else tell you not to celebrate that love for other people, for the whole, for all of, like, you know, you see other people, yeah, I agree with you that we're, that the, it's an illusion of separateness, that we're human beings, that we're different people, of course. And I, I think it's so abstract that, that while you're still within the ego, while you're not doing your meditation practice, while you're not, and by the way, I think you do have to read a book like yours at least for 15 minutes every single day minimum, do one or two meditations per day. And if you do that, you keep the spiritual truth, the spiritual element of, of life alive. You get through the day without losing it. You're always in, you're always in, that, in that place of, of awareness and present moment awareness and things like this. And if people aren't doing that, they, they, they read a book like yours or like Eckhart Tolle or Course in Miracles or whatever, and they go on with their lives and they, and they just kind of forget. And, and then they, and they say, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to try to forgive people and love them. And, and yet I can't. How can I overlook this, this sin? How can I overlook this? So what can you say about that? That's what I get for resistance is, you know, how can you just, just condone someone's behavior by looking past all their sins uh, or what they're doing to me? How do I, how do I love somebody who, who I'm, I'm perceiving as being impossible to love for, for whatever reasons? How do, you, how do you talk to people about that? Well, the first step is you said who I perceiving as you got to check to see if your perception is real or not. Right. It could be just a projection from your past that you're projecting on them. So that's the first thing you got to get clear in yourself through meditation, like you said, and so that you can witness your own thoughts and see what filters are perceiving your partner through your old story from childhood. Once you're clear of that, if the image that's reflecting back to you still is not loving or still doesn't feel natural accepting of who you are mm -hmm. then and you've accepted who you are 
then I walk away from those relationships. Right. Because they're old. They're reflecting my old self, my shame-based self. They're not reflect, and sometimes that's family members. Exactly, and that's the hardest thing because you're, you're, it's so, and that's where the fear comes into it because you have a life situation where you do depend on someone, you have children with someone, and you, you want access to your children every day, and if, and if you, um, if you're not, you know, if you come out at, truly as, at, and live your truth and, and say what you mean and, and you awaken from ego, um, you know, ego and, 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 and spirit, I guess you could say, don't, don't, can't communicate, they don't understand each other. And so those relationships are threatened. And, and I think what I found is I didn't have to, um, you know, walk away from people or, or, you know, people talk about toxic relationships and breaking and people, cutting people off. I just tell the truth and people naturally leave. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I do. Right. But that's the same thing. It's just harder for some people. But when yeah. anyone listening, if they're in a toxic relationship, they have to do what Mark said and tell the truth starting with your own truth i'm not happy my own truth um you you're abusive i feel abused by you it's always right, better to start with the i not the you yeah that's non that's nonviolent communication so but the the truth will set you free as jesus said so that's right. on every level but i'm always pointing to the deeper truth that how have you attracted this person into your life what are the lessons that you're learning from it? And, and are you using it as a device for your awakening, for the uh, transcending of your ego, or even escaping from your ego, as you said? Yeah, and, and, and it's possible. Is, and the ego is the only one who has an issue with your ex-wife, the mother of your children. So what you do is when you wake up, you transcend your ego or you put it aside temporarily, of and course. you come in service. That's the highest way to relate to a human being. Exactly. How may I serve you? How may I serve my ex-wife? How may I serve my children? And you put your ego aside and you be in service at least during the time frame that you need to be. I want to come back to that point, but I also want to mention this idea of service. And that's one of the parts of my book that I'd be love where I half my book, I describe what love isn't. And then the other half, what love is. And one of that's the, what I'm, and I'm hoping I don't lose the readers. <laughs> I'm hoping I don't lose the readers in the first half of what it is. It you right, know? <laughs> exactly because they think that's what it is. And and so yeah, service and giving that's everything. And they say that love doesn't pay to rent. And I say yeah, it does because if you if you love your customers and you serve your customers, you make you can or your clients or whatever. That's how you make money. Also, it's how the service you know to align with love. That's how you have a wonderful. A parental and child relationship or you have a wonderful marriage or relationship you have wonderful customer relationships or business relationships or work relationships it's all about giving instead of receiving um, and by the way we're talking a lot about relationships and how you know the challenges and I have to say to anyone listening from your side that doesn't know who I am I've been in a relationship now for five years that it's it's perfect it is totally open and honest we're not we're not um, holding each other hostage for the purpose of preserving and protecting that love. We're totally free and open people have a ch child together. And it's just and that feeling of being in love and that attraction doesn't go away. What people do is they kill those feelings and they kill that wonderful spark that originally starts in the relationship with all these rules and expectations, arguments and control and all these things people do. So it is possible with two people who are, who are awakened from ego, at least most of the time, <laughs> or intend to be and really mean it, uh, it is entirely possible in a relationship or, or alone as you're doing, which is, which is probably the, the, the easier way or the more pure way to go no, about this. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of beautiful, deep relationships. They're right. just non-sexual with right. women and men. And right. most of them that aren't from my history are young people. So Prasad shows up in young people's lives. And I become a very important figure. I don't have any children of my own. Right. So I have amazing relationships in this world. People who love me deeply and who I love them. And I sometimes no drama rises. Sometimes drama rises. So in the book, I differentiate between impersonal love and personal love. Impersonal love is the higher love we've been speaking of. It's of service. It's egoless. And personal love is the ego working out its stuff. Right. I'm not judging personal love. I'm just saying personal love will never satisfy your soul the way impersonal love does. That's right. And impersonal love is unconditional. 
It's not based on whether or not the object of affection meets the expectation of the seeker. That's now, exactly it. Impersonal love we're born with, we die with, we are, and before our birth and after our death, we are impersonal love eternally. Love is unconditional. If there's a condition on love, it's not love. It's something else. It's, if it's, if it's an arrangement, it's a situation you've negotiated with someone. Let's, let's, let's shift gears here. And I want to talk well, about... Can I say one thing? Can I say yeah. one thing? Yeah. The reason I chose this subject and the usefulness of it is when people are working on their relationships and, and loving themselves and transcending their shame, when you do that, that's how you awaken. Then you're in the second relationship if you leave the first or the first one uh, elevates and you're happy the way you are. So it's not by changing your partner. It's right. by changing yourself be the change you want to see in the world exactly and I, and I as i went through that process just five years ago or so and, I, and i've always had the attitude that i'm wide open to my ex my ex-wife and even now I, I tell my partner now that if she if she awakens and wants to be part of my life she's i'm wide open like you, you don't cut someone off and say like throw someone away and try it again and of course the world sees it that way but really it's a, it's a change of heart it's a it's a coming to, to god or it's, you know it's in our in our way of, of speaking love is the same and also, thing. Again, there's nothing really outside. It's all in a mirror. I this right. morning I woke up and the inner voice said to me, focus on consciousness, not on the objects that appear in consciousness. Now let's so talk about that. Yep. As the self, as love, divide as love. We're going to attract loving relationships into our life. We're going to shift the current relationships in our life because it's our reality projecting on the other person that's creating the suffering so when you remove your own suffering you escape your ego you live as love then all the relationships either don't affect you negatively or inspire you positively right it does get it does get to be very easy relationships kind of the drama kind of goes away I, I, you know, I think, and I, I wrote a book about recently um, called The Switch and talking about how drama, what is drama? It's when you're dishonest and then you have that ongoing sort of feeling of suffering when there's dishonesty and truth being withheld. And what is crisis? Crisis is when someone finds out the truth about something. And let's, let's talk, let's talk about the world events, I think a little bit. I think, I think that's probably even more interesting to people than, than personal relationships these, these days, because especially for those, you know, with like myself with with a family with two families basically to support you know there's there's the natural tendency to want to go to fear because you, you know if you if you're if you're <laughs> if you would want to abuse yourself and turn on the news or read the news which i don't i try not to do um you know you're being told that that there's very real forces out there and everyone thinks there's these real powerful forces that are doing all this and that the, the COVID is going to, it's going to kill us or that the government's going to, there's some other motive where the government's going to do something to us. And one of the, the fundamental uh, pillars of any kind of spiritual faith has to be the idea that you are invulnerable as consciousness, that as Course in Miracles says, you know, that which is real cannot be threatened. So we're talking about what's real, which is that we are love, we are consciousness, and the world keeps trying to tell us that there's something to be afraid of because that pulls you away from love, that pulls you into ego. And so, so how can you talk a little bit? I think we probably share this, this idea, but I'd love to hear the way you describe this in terms of, you know, you, you worry about what's going to happen with the economy or with your job or with something in your life. How do you avoid the, or, or do, you, do you have any fear ever? And I, I personally probably wouldn't if it were just me. I was responsible for financially. It's, it's kind of the fear for my children and things like this that sometimes I'm just a little bit like, ah, that's fear. I want to I want to get past that. But it does creep up at certain, t certain times with business and things like this. H how would you talk to people about, about how important is it to escape fear and how would you go about doing that? So to answer your question, um, people are living in fear First of all, based on the, the identification with their body, okay? So they think they're their body and they fear their body will get sick and die. Now, as the Course in Miracles mentions, hate is not the opposite of fear. Love is the opposite of fear. So when we focus on love, the way I instruct in my book, then the fear naturally goes away. 
The fear comes from the mind. So through meditation, when you have a thought, oh, I hope I have enough money to do this, or um, my family might be suffering this month because of the lockdown, then you witness that thought, the same as you do in meditation, you let it go and you be still and listen to your inner voice. I have a chapter called the inner voice of awareness. And that inner voice will speak to you like it did to me this morning, right? I don't know if this got recorded or not, I'll repeat it. No, it, it said, doesn't. Okay, it got recorded? Yeah. Focus on consciousness, not on the objects that appear in consciousness. That was like a voice in my head saying that as I woke up this morning. Yeah. It doesn't always happen that way. It's more of a knowing. So some people it'll be a knowing, some people it'll be a voice, but that will guide you. And miracles can unfold in that trust and surrender. If you are in fear, you're in your mind and you feel separate from God, from love. When you're in oneness, connected with God, you're in surrender to God, that God will take care of us the same way God takes care of the plants and the animals. That's the surrender that comes with awakening. So for you and me, at the level that we're at in our consciousness, if a thought of fear arises, it's our job to witness it and not engage with it, Mark. Right. And exactly. to stay in love, to stay as God consciousness, to trust the moment. It may be showing up in a way that our ego doesn't like, but we trust life, we trust existence, and everything is flowing in divine order, even if the mind can't see it yet. Exactly. You can't judge good or bad. You don't know what's good or bad. It's too complex. Well, that's no, but that's what non-duality is. When you yeah. wake up, you realize there is no good and bad. Those right. are just thoughts. They're pretty, exactly. they're and you're, one person's good is another person's bad. So, And coming to that, let's speak a little. I'd like to hear your thoughts about what's going on in the world. Not necessarily the, the, uh, the scenario, but people's reaction to it yeah. coming from fear. And how they've been not only divided into two courts, red and blue, yep. but each court, each side is so angry at the other as if they were responsible for their own suffering. <laughs> for their own and, fear, so, yeah. and if you speak from the woke perspective that you and I have, that people can read our blogs if they're interested on in our websites, you and I are very aligned, then they will be educated. But we don't try to convince anyone that there's nothing to fear. People's minds have been so programmed by COVID and way before COVID through media, no, exactly. through institutional education, through religion, and their minds are so programmed. That's why my book is designed to help people drop their mind and live in freedom, live as love. That's the only answer Prasad has to what's going on in the world. And I think it's the only answer that... It's the only and answer you know, that, that we can. Engages us. Have yeah. you had any? This is what I wanted to ask you. Have you had any fights with people trying to educate them about what's really going on with COVID and the lockdowns, etc.? The new reset, the great reset. The great reset. Well, I don't. I don't get into f debate. I don't debate. I don't. I don't fight. But I have at times. I do speak the truth, right? So when someone says something about um, about COVID. You know, I might say, or for example, about the government measures. Who bothers me most are the government measures, the lack of personal yeah. liberty. And I, and I do yeah. say, you know, my concern is lack of personal liberty and freedom because that's kind of, I thought that was kind of a big deal in, in life. And then people get all worked up about that and, and I just let them go. And I think they're projecting. I think that they know it's true. They know that deep down, they know there's a fundamental problem with surrendering your freedom to the government. And so they're projecting that onto how dare you say that and they get any kind of anger is projection, which is just you, you feel it inside yourself and you're trying to throw it away from yourself to the other person and get rid of that feeling. So I don't get too concerned about and I don't have any emotional reaction to somebody trying to attack me, which doesn't happen very often. But what I, what I wanted to say is that I think the inevitable outcome of this, and it may be a long, long process for many, many years, and the only outcome that, that is possible is where we've arrived. Because I think what's going to happen is that people are going to continue. It's not going to be easily solved where someone feels safe. Uh, the economy is going to implode, and and then this, you know, the, the great reset. They're trying to build things up again, but then there's a lot of conditions about lack of personal freedom and problems like that. And there's always and they're always going to make people believe that the, that either the world is scary or that um, or that the government is scary, and they want us to think they have. They have this power, you know. My my family and people I know where I grew up in Wisconsin, 
they're really, really afraid of end times and the second coming of Jesus Christ and the government coming in and giving them shots to turn them, to turn them into robots, basically. And I keep saying, like, I, I know there, there probably is an agenda like that, you know, with Bill Gates and all this. But they don't have that power. They don't have that technology. You cannot threaten what you truly are. You cannot threaten the consciousness within you, the love within you. And this is the message that Jesus gave on the cross, that even if you have to walk to, the, to the, your death on the cross, you're beyond threat, and we all are. And if you don't believe that, if you're clinging to your physical body in this life, and, and my parents are in their 60s, 70s, and they're still doing that, and that concerns me because they're not getting them, and they're, and they're, and they're claiming to be Christians who want to transcend this world and so forth, but they're clinging on to that body, and they're scared of that government, and they're scared of this. So I think that, and I've talked about this, and I don't want to go into depth here, but basically, if there is something like a second coming, or the, I think it's the end of ego. And I think it's what's happening, and where, whereas people are going to, to need to awaken from this nightmare, and there will be a new era where, where, where the thought process, the thought systems are different, and it is a loving thought system and not an egoic thought system, because ego is imploding. It's not even functional anymore. I'd like to, I wouldn't use the word thought system either. Awareness, you said, because thought confuses the thought, you know. But I think the second coming, I felt this for many years, is the mass awakening of consciousness on, on planet Earth. Right. Okay? And, uh, you know, I woke up 35 years ago or more, and I've been living in this awakened state. That's the challenge, actually. Many people can awaken, whether you sit with a powerful guru, whether you take psychedelics, whether you practice tantra, whether you meditate. It's living from the awakened state in your actions, thoughts, and deeds that allow us to elevate this world into critical mass. And I feel like when enough of us wake up like we're talking about, we're going to recreate this illusion of reality to reflect that consciousness. And there may be people who aren't at that reality, and they'll be in a different reality. It's not about, con I finally came to the realization, it's not about convincing another person that their reality is wrong or their approach is wrong. No, everyone is God having a human experience. So everyone's in a virtual reality game and people are at different places in their journey to experience what it's like to be human with the suffering, the shadow. I don't run from the shadow. I invite people to embrace the shadow, but the shadow is part of duality. When you transcend a duality, there's not as much shadow. It's as simple as that. We're so, all God. We're all God. But we're, as, as human forms, we're all here to teach. We're all here to teach. And, and consciousness is, is there. Yeah. The reason for life is so that this great one consciousness can absorb all of these experiences, which you would never have without form doing stuff, right? So we're, we're, you know, in death, we go back and we take what we've learned. Even in life, we're teaching everyone. Everyone we know, everything happening is a great teacher, what not to do or what to do and, and so forth. Um, so yeah, exactly. I, I fully agree with you that there's no destination here. There's no perfect end game where everybody agrees. Everything's perfect. I don't think we would even would want that situation. Um, but the most empowering, most empowering realization to heal the COVID uh, mania is to realize we're not our body. So that's the second half of my book. When we to say the world isn't real, you have to first realize that you aren't real. Right. Then you see the world as a reflection of that. And so when we're not our body, it means we are not born and we don't die. So if there is no death, there's nothing to be afraid of. And That's so right. all the spiritual traditions have pointed to this. I'm not saying I know what the afterlife is. I just know that who I am, the I am that you have on your website, <laughs> I am is eternal. Once you've tapped into it through meditation or plant medicine or whatever, you know this. And that's the first step of awakening. Yep. Eternal love that's connected to everything. Oneness. Oneness, timelessness. Oh, I wanted to address, I got this earlier, stress. Some of your listeners are in stress. Of course, mm -hmm. in response to COVID, a response to the economic lockdown, everything you talked about, you use the word fear. But people call it stress. Yep. And I'd like to address that, that stress comes from time. And time is an illusion. Time is a 
thought that's that's there's only now, as you know, as Eckhart Tolle popularized, as the wonderful uh, Ram Das, who recently ascended, popularized yep. in his Be Here Now. There's only now. So that's one of the basic first steps to awakening. So what does that mean? There's only the eternal now. There's no past, no future. So there's no time. Time is mine. So if people are resting in awareness, they're not going to stress about deadlines. It doesn't mean that we're not on time. I made my nine o'clock appointment with you. <laughs> right. But that's the schedule. That's not the time that stresses us. That time is connected to our worthiness. And if I don't do it, I'll get rejected. I cover all of this in, in, in the book. And then, and once I, again, you know, tell us how to get that book. Tell the audience how to, how to read the book. Yeah, well, on my website, it's on Amazon. You all love uh, Awakening to Your True Self. And uh, my website is prasadpaulduffy.com, my uh, name, which is also my Instagram and Facebook, Prasad, P-R-A-S-A-D, Paul Duffy. I received the name Prasad 25 years ago from Papa G. Mm -hmm. who is a, and he's, he's Muji's guru too, for anyone who's a Muji lover out there, he's super popular. And um, his, Papaji's guru was Ramana Maharshi. And uh, people can research him as well. He woke up at 17 and never left the mountain and they built a huge ashram around him. So wow. awakening takes different forms for different aspects of the self. Remember that everyone. Don't try to wake up like Jesus or Buddha or even your teacher. Find your own path. And that's what Mark and I have been sharing is all of these challenges in your life, they're actually grist for the mill. If you embrace them, they will help you transcend your ego. If you resist them, then you're in your ego. Exactly, exactly. That's, and I, 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 it's an honor to talk to you because you've walked this path for so, for so long. I, I'm still relatively new, five years into it. But I, but I think once you get once you live it in the open, you don't go back. Once you, it's a superior way to live your life, obviously, to enjoy versus, versus stress. Um, and once you experience it, but you don't get to experience it by keeping it to yourself. It's not just about reading the right books. And, and I don't want to talk about this. It's, it's kind of, this is for people to keep to themselves. No, you have to loudly and, and openly live it, not force it on people, but not shy away from it either. And, 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 and more importantly, in everything you do, and your decisions on how to respond to things, what is the loving response, um, you know, and, and the other ideas we talked about, which is all part of the same thought system, the same, the same awakening, the realization of, of reality. Um, but you've been, you've been, our paths are quite different. Now we'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty soon, but I wanted to mention that from my perspective, I know you've met some really interesting people along your path, Mary Williamson, you said to me, um, you know, you've, you've been, you're a guru, you've, you've been, helping and teaching so many people I'm sure throughout the years whereas I'm kind of out here in in Slovakia most of the time of all places where and doing my thing online and doing my businesses and my music and everything else and so I've not had that that pleasure of meeting some of the people that are like me uh, so it's a real honor for me to to, to meet you and I, I don't appreciate you reaching out to me actually and asking for this but uh yeah, if you wanted to maybe end the end this podcast, we can do another one someday if we feel like doing yeah, more. I want to I want to do a wrap up uh, yeah. that I was inspired to say. Let me see if I can remember. I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh yeah, is that the reason I've come back more into public life? Whereas I've been in retreat uh, the last two years. Prior to that, I was in Hollywood. I was um, producing music and and writing films. And um, I gave that all up and moved to Costa Rica. But because of what's happening in the world, I believe it is vital for humans to wake up and remember who we are before it is too late. And the simple awakening that you and I, we're not special, that we have gone through, we invite everyone listening to go through it. Mark's available to coach you, Prasad's available to coach you, and there's a plethora of gurus and teachers. You know, when I started teaching 30 years ago, there weren't a lot of us. And Eckhart right. Tolle came after me, okay? Right. And so now, so many people, especially the millennials, are awakening and teaching. Some of them aren't fully cooked, but their intention is good and they'll reach people at where they're at. But my mission right now, bro, is to meet people like you, influencers and other awake beings, and that we have our own agenda. 
the Enlightenment agenda, so that A, what's happening in the governments with the lockdown in, in response to a virus that only kills 6% of, or 0.06% yeah. of the nation, right. that whole taking of our liberties, which is what I wrote my play about, but in addition to that, the AI transhumanist movement, the singularity, the high-tech revolution, the spying, lack of privacy, all of that, microchips, all of that is actually happening now. So right. the sci-fi movies of the past are now. And if we don't wake up and learn how to use this technology with our heart, what I call heart-centered technology, then it will use us. That's the prediction of the singularity and the generations to come. We should not allow that to happen. We should protect our children's children's children from that happening. And that it's a slow rollout. 5G is a perfect example. Yeah. The 5G wireless, everybody's going to want to do, do it because it makes it fast. We won't have the same uh, uh, interruptions that we're having on our, our <laughs> podcast. But yeah. the, a lot of people say that the, the health um, uh, the lack of benefit, what am I, what am I looking for? The health uh, precautions the that, yeah. that can happen as a result of that bandwidth may not be worth the, 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 the pleasure of a faster uh, webcast. So we need to speak, we need to wake up and have this conversation with people, but they've been programmed through fear. So the first step is to wake people up or they won't be able to listen to the next step, right? I, I mean, we don't have that much power in terms of stopping 5G or stopping this from happening. And, this, and by the way, I, I've been resisting this. It sounds so wacky that Bill Gates is doing this and, and all this is happening. And, and I mean, people have been telling me this for months. I'm like, Look, I don't want to. I'm withdrawing from this nonsense. I'm not going to deal with it. I don't want to deal with getting sucked into some conspiracy theories. I've been there with 9-11. I've done that before. And, but this is different. I, I found I did find out a lot in, in the past week actually about the Great Reset. Look it up. The World Economic Forum, the UN, they're wide open about this. And the, and they and Bill Gates, yeah, he's, this is this is his actual agenda. And it's happening now. They think it's happening. Agenda twenty thirty. It's yeah. called Agenda twenty thirty. It used to be Agenda twenty twenty one. Right. And you know, I when I was a young man, I re read a book called None Dare Call It Conspiracy, and it spoke about the richest families in the world, like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and others, how they back both sides of the revolutions, both sides of the world wars. They've been doing this for over a hundred years and people before them, their, their relatives, ancestors have been doing it since the Kings. I know. So but it's like we're still, people are still living as serfs and the kings are still running the world. But let's so not, but let's not leave it with that. I don't agree with that because no, I don't no, think they, you interrupted they, me. You interrupted they, me. No, Our I, message, and I include you and I, is to empower ourselves by waking up, moving out of fear, moving out of identification with who we are as a limited body, and then these powers that think they have control have no control over us. That's right. And that's why it never works. They've been trying for thousands of years to have total control over us, and they keep, think they, they keep thinking they're getting closer and closer, and there are times when it seems that it's true, like this year. And after 9-11, the same thing happened in, in the U.S., where people did, out of fear, get surrendered to the greater police state and, and the wars and all this stuff. And, and now this is just on a new level, and everything is always on a new level. But because of people like you and me and the millions of others who are brave, are, are willing to tell the truth, to speak the truth without fear, um, you know, it never quite works because, because they're not being honest, right? Um, you know, what's his name, Klaus, Klaus Schwab and all these people. I mean, they're kind of open about it, but they're not, they're not open about the fact that they're kind of using COVID or planning COVID for this purpose. So they start the whole thing off by breaking our trust entirely. And I am for a lot of the principles. I am absolutely for uh, greater equality and social. I want to, you know, I'm, I'm starting a social conscious business. It's fantastic ideas. But if it's such a good idea, why are you not honest about it? It breaks the trust right from the start. And we're going to be honest, and honesty always wins. Dishonesty always leads to suffering. We'll look around. The world is suffering. And then ultimately a crisis, and it's going to be their crisis. They're, they're not going to succeed. And we're going to deal, and the world's going to be thrown into turmoil because of all the forces battling right now. And it's, they think it's 
history is done and they won. It's not true. There's other forces that aren't going along with this because even those who, who were in that room at, at Davos, maybe they, they see the reality of COVID and they start doubting it, right? So if you're not going to be honest with us, you're not respecting us, you're not valuing our divinity, you don't get to rule over anybody, right? So it's not going to work. It's just going to be a lot of turmoil. And that's ultimately why we shouldn't, we should, we should be brave enough to, to accept the truth that this is happening in the world. But the greater truth is that it cannot work because what's real about you and I, and us, this one being that we are consciousness, is that we cannot be threatened. And that's where you find some peace of God. Like Gandhi, you know? And it only really takes one person to stand up and start a revolution which in our case is more of an evolution. So I just want to say before we finish to anyone who's listening who is awake like us, I applaud you, I celebrate you, and I invite you to take action. I call it spiritual activism. My friend Marianne Williamson is a perfect example of it. Thich Nhat Hanh, Dalai Lama. Now, now is not the time to stay home and meditate in your cave. Now's the time for people like us to move through the world online or in person, you know, and influence the world with love. Balance out the negativity with positivity. Awaken the, those afraid who are identified with their mind to the truth of who they are, and then they will awaken themselves. Perfectly you see, stated. You know, when I was in the mountain of Arunachala last year, after 20, 30 years, I didn't go back to India, and I went back last year, the, the realization rose for me, I think you'll appreciate this, we can't really wake anybody up. Yeah. Our only work is to stay awake ourselves and reflect people in that awakening. And so we know the truth about COVID and the world governments, but we're not afraid. And I Great love place. how you shared. I love your perspective about that. Well, we're more powerful than them, especially in the numbers. So I, I think your prediction is accurate. They're going to fail. Let's we have better back. technology. We have better technology being human. We have voices. We have bodies. We have everything we need. And if they want to offer us some nice technology, that's wonderful. We use it. But if it gets to be this way, forget about it. We'll just go back to being human, being natural state. So anyway, you said it better than I, that I'm going to try to say anything more. I think that's a fantastic. I would love to talk to you more someday when, we're, when things develop further and so forth. And I, love, I love you, and I, and I really appreciate what you're doing. And, of course, we love our audience. And, and uh, both, I think both of us are available to do any other kinds of podcasts or interviews or discussions with anybody who feels called. Uh, please get in touch with either of us. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Thank I you. look forward to our next chat. Thank you very much, Prasad. Bye for now.